Jerry Dunifer is a professor emeritus of Wayne State University's Physics and Astronomy, Astronomy Department. So he has traveled much more of the astronomical world than most of us have, and he's seen some really amazing things. Uh, for this particular trip, he didn't have to leave the country, but uh, he still saw some pretty amazing things. I am one of the many sponsors of Light Sail 2. I think there are some other people here who have kicked into the Planetary Society project. So this was a super exciting launch. I wish I could have been there, but I, like you, will get to attend by proxy. So without further ado, Jerry, take it away. Miles above the surface of the Earth. 
Uh, down there in the visitor center is also the space shuttle Atlantis. And here you see the external tank and the two solid rocket boosters. And then the building behind is the orbiter itself. So this is the view from the ground floor. And from the balcony, one can look into the open bay, Palo Bay, which is some 60 feet in length and 15 feet in diameter. So at the, towards the end of the first day in the late afternoon, there was a session for everybody attending in the Planetary Society. Uh, there were several hundred of us, and we first met for a two-hour session. And in that session, we were given an update of what was happening and a preview of the activity for the following day. And then later that evening, we had a gala banquet. And mm, I'm here in the banquet at the VIP table. I had to pay an extra thousand dollars to sit at the VIP table. But it gave me a chance to witness the launching with Bill Nye. Cool. So this was the MC for the evening at the banquet. This is uh, Mike Chaplin, who was the primary announcer uh, for uh, Planetary Radio, which is a portion of the Planetary Society. We also got to hear uh, Bill Nye. Uh, demonstrate to us how he was originally employed as a stand-up comedian. <laughs> okay, the next day it's uh, nice and clear and it continued that way until the launch. I took a tour of the area on the bus and the next few slides I, I will show are some of the things uh, one saw from the bus. This is uh, the Redstone Rocket. Oops. Redstone rocket, which took Alan Shepard into space. <coughs> the vehicle assembly building. It's one of the largest buildings in the world. It's 130 million cubic feet. So that's one of the largest volume-wise. Stands about 526 feet high. So they use this building for assembling the larger rockets. It's in the space shuttle Saturn V and so on. This is as close as we got to the Falcon Heavy on the bus uh, tour. We're about two miles away from it. <clears throat> so that is the rocket. And then zooming in uh, closer, uh, you can see the rocket in a little more detail. And we also have a couple birds over here who have flown in early for a good seat. You uh, see the launching out of that evening. Launching was originally scheduled for 11.30 in the evening. So this is going to be a night launch. Uh, this is a NASA picture. And um, what you might notice is that the first stage, second stage, and the payload are a nice, uh, clean, white, bright, white color. Whereas the two booster rockets are looking rather scuffy. That's because they've been used previously and recovered, and they're being used uh, again. But they haven't bothered to repaint them. So now we're in the Apollo Saturn V uh, Center. So we have the Saturn V rocket uh, taken apart to the individual stages. And this is the rocket that was used to uh, carry man to the moon in Project Apollo. So we start out with the first stage. And then walking along it. Uh, second stage, third stage, and we're now at the other end and looking back. Uh, this is the compartment in Ozone where the three astronauts rode and the escape tower, which fortunately never had to be used. So in the evening of the second day, uh, the general public starts lining up. They come by the thousands to witness this launch, and they're waiting for buses which will take them out uh, to the viewing area. Uh, those of us who paid a lot of money and were classified as VIP people didn't have to stand in line. There was a special brought bus that came to us, no waiting at all. And then we were taken back to the Apollo uh, Saturn V building where we met in a conference room about 40 feet up, up above the ground and the main floor. So here we are in that conference room. There are about 30 of us total. We have a nice uh, triangular table, a right triangle. And through this door, that takes us to an outside uh, balcony where we're able to watch the launch. Cool. So out of the balcony, 
This is the launch area over here. We're at a distance of uh, 3.9 miles, and I'm thinking that looks awfully far away, and I'm kind of disappointed because I don't think we'll be able to see very much, but this is as close as they will let us get. Uh, on the ground below us, these are employees of uh, SpaceX. They have their own large screen over here, which shows them close-up views of what's happening. And off to the right, just out of the view, there's a dance band, which is uh, playing all evening long. So using my camera and zooming in a bit closer, from 3.9 miles, this is um, the launch vehicle. About 30 minutes uh, before we're going to be launching the rocket, we can see uh, they're loading the liquid oxygen onto the rocket. You can see a lot of the vapors which are being emitted from that process. So this is looking at that large screen for the SpaceX employees. And they show us various things. And so at a T minus 16 minutes 52 seconds, they're showing us a view directly below the rocket. This is a place you would not want to be. <laughs> so this is the main uh, stage and the two boosters, total of 27 individual engines. And at T minus 16 minutes 25 uh, seconds, looking at the same screen, you know, we can see the rocket and, and the uh, boil off of the vapors coming from the liquid oxygen for the first stage and the two boosters. They haven't yet started uh, putting liquid oxygen into the second stage. So this is a picture I took three seconds before uh, t equals zero. You can see the third quarter moon up here. This is the launch area over here. So at t minus three, two, one. At t equals zero, uh, the view changes considerably. Wow. <laughs> That's what it looked like. And then a few seconds later, well, this is a uh, picture, uh, this is an NASA picture taken up close. And then back at my camera, a few seconds after T equals zero, it looks like this. We're 3.9 miles back, and it takes 18 seconds for the sound to reach us. So we hear nothing for the first 18 seconds. And then the sound hits us. It's like being hit in both ears with hammers. Mm. It was incredibly loud. I put my fingers in both ears. The building was shaking. The window was rattling. It was quite an overwhelming experience. Not to mention just how bright this was, uh, even just about four miles away. And a few more photos. I've taken a few seconds apart as the rocket gets higher and higher. And at this point, uh, the boosters have separated, and they're returning to the Space Center for landing. So you can see the trails of the boosters off to the side, and the main rocket uh, continues on into orbit. And a few minutes later, here come the two boosters down. So the, these are the uh, flames from the, the engines as they're coming back. And just a few seconds before they land, this is the, the booster which is close to us. <coughs> Unfortunately, when they touch down on the ground, they're just around the edge of our building. And so we're not able to see that happening. But um, up until the last few seconds, we can follow them all the way down. This is a picture taken by somebody else. Uh, long time exposure showing you the launch. And the return of the two boosters back to the ground, both landing safely. So just a little bit about light sail. It's a square sail, 18.4 feet on the side, has a weight of 11 pounds. It's made from aluminized mylar, one five thousandth of an inch thick. The orbit it is now in is inclined 24 degrees with respect to the equator which means that we at 42 degrees north latitude cannot see it from here. So if you want to see it, you have to get into your car and drive a few hundred miles south. Okay, so the orbit was initially circular, 450 miles above the surface, 
And prior to deployment, it was folded into a three-unit CubeSat with measured 4.5 by 4.5 by 13.4 inches, size of a loaf of bread, which was a very compact package. So before launch, this is the sail. This is a control unit in the center. Uh, the sail is made up of four uh, triangular components, which together make up the square. And they are spread out by four booms, spread out from the central region, each 13 feet long. And this is a control unit. It contains the electronics, contains photo cells, which are here, two cameras, one there, one over here, a uh, reaction wheel, which is used to rotate the sail in space. For more information, uh, the project costs $7 million. The ground stations for controlling it were uh, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo in California, and Georgia Tech, and listed there in the name of some of the other individuals and the companies responsible for building this. So a little bit about uh, the physical process. Uh, if this is a sail seen edgewise, the light coming from the sun is made of little particles called photons. They have zero rest mass. They travel at the speed of light, but they also carry energy and momentum. And when a photon is reflected from the sail, that results in a change in momentum of the photon, which produces a force on the sail, perpendicular to the force uh, as indicated, perpendicular to the sail. Now, there's a huge number of photons striking this sail every second uh, coming from the sun at our distance from the sun, 10 to the 23rd power. So that's 100 billion trillion photons per second. Here is the net effect of those photons when, it's, when the sail is oriented so it intercepts maximum sunlight. The net force is very weak, it's uh, about 1,000th of an hour. The acceleration is, increase in velocity is 0 0.058 millimeters per second each second. But um, since the sun is always shining, if the light is on the sail continuously, that speed builds up. After one month, it can be up to 540 kilometers per hour. And after 16 months, it can be up to 8,600 kilometers per hour, which is the escape velocity from the moon. So this illustrates um, how, the, how the sail works. So here the sun is off to the left. The photons are streaming uh, left to right. So the orbit is initially circular. When the sail is at the bottom of the orbit, then the photons are striking the sail in such a way as to push it forward, giving it an increase in velocity. So the sail is oriented perpendicular to the sunlight at the bottom, which pushes it out further at the top of its orbit. And this happens over and over again. So this becomes a perigee closest point to Earth, and apogee, furthest point from Earth. So again, this happens over and over again. Um, <clears throat> looking at the data that they have on their website, it looks like they get a boost of about 16 meters or 50 feet with each orbit, and that increases the apogee, pushes it out by about 800 feet per day, for 24 hours. This is an artist picture of a space sail out of space in orbit. This is a picture taken from space sail by one of his cameras. And so you can see the sail in the foreground. This is a wide angle lens, and so there's quite a bit of distortion. And down below, does anybody recognize the distance? Uh, yeah, that's Baja, California. And this is another picture without the sail. Uh, Baja, California. And now I have a couple of quick videos. Let me see if I can make them work. Here we go. And we've uh, lost our sound. So anyway, this uh, shows a uh, very... Can you turn up the sound? Oh. Anyway, 
that shows the uh, the crown post for how they go together for a lot of screws. <clears throat> and that antenna down here at the bottom, which is used uh, for communication. And these are the solar panels that provide electrical power. Sure. And I have one final one minute video. Hey Jerry? Yes. How do they change the angle? Does it have uh, RCS thrusters or reaction wheels on it? No, they have a reaction wheel.
Say again? Is there anything else happening that we're seeing in time exposure photograph of the launch? Like the Earth moving away from the place where it launched, moving away from where it is heading? Well, the camera's going to be heading east and be just heading to the, the uh, trail of the rock yeah. relative yeah. to the Earth. Yeah. Well, basically, the rocket is launching and the atmosphere is moving past it where, while the Earth rotates below it. Is that a factor uh, in, in the sort of currents that we see in rocket launches? Well, when uh, the Earth and the atmosphere rotate together, Right. And so the rock is moving up through them, and gradually it is transitioning from a vertical flight to a horizontal flight as it gets up into orbit. Yeah, Jeff? Yeah, you, you said it had 28 engines, is that correct? It had 27. 27. Does that mean 27 nozzles? Yeah, 27 nozzles. 27 nozzles. That, separate that's... engines. Well, okay. I'll, 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 I'll talk to you later about it. Okay. That. Yeah, for the back. So what was the final, is there a final destination for the sail? How long is the mission? Um, I thought this will stay in orbit for about a year. Uh, they're not going to be leaving the Earth's orbit. Uh, from, from the best I can gather from looking at their website, it looks like they're trying different things because it's, it's moving up and down different distances uh, from that circular orbit. Uh, the furthest it's been from the circular orbit is about uh, Eight kilometers, five miles. With the average, he puts that far out from the original circular orbit. Ken? Why did they launch in the nighttime? Why? Um, Just curious. Uh, I don't know. It may have been the Air Force's requirement. We were piggybacking onto this mission, and that they had a certain window in which they had to launch in order to get. The satellites where they wanted. That, that probably was the Air Force requirement. Yes? Since this is all new to me, was the purpose of it to see how much energy it can get from the sun for solar energy? Or is it, it just it was, was to try out the concept okay. and see how well it worked. But uh, other things have used solar energy, though, in orbit of... Around well, they use right? solar energy for photocells cells to generate electrical power for the satellite. But this is the first time they... they Significantly build a satellite specifically to use the solar solar energy to sail on, like a sailboat does here on Earth. So now, what, one could build much larger um, solar sails, which, which could be hundreds of feet or even miles in size, and then you get a much larger force, and then you could use that to cruise around the solar system uh, for free. You don't need any rocket right. fuel. You, the energy is there continually. In the same way, if you're in a sailboat sailing, as long as the wind is blowing, you can go anywhere. You can go away from the wind, you can tack into the wind, and the same is true with a solar sail. Thank you. Are the, are the boosters uh, liquid fuel or solid rocket No, they're, they're, they are liquid fuel. Smart the, the, man. The center, core, those. the center core and the two boosters are, I think, pretty much huh? identical. I'll, I'll use liquid fuel, the RP-1 and the liquid oxygen. That way they can control them when they're coming back by adjusting the thrust so they can land it smoothly and essentially zero speed. Okay, well thank you again.